Well, thank you very, very much for the invitation to speak uh, at this um, very good conference, especially to Marcus and the organizer, uh, Julio Velarde, uh, the president of the Central Bank, and um, uh, all of the good friends that I've made over the years. You know, as you know, I uh, am from Peru, and the Central Bank uh, well, was is a very important part of my life. I, uh, it, was, it was my first job as an economist. And when thinking about um, this topic that Paul Casillo suggested to me, secular stagnation and, um, and the policy mix, and um, the first thing that um, I thought was, well, why should I worry about it? And um, one of the reasons why I thought, I mean, what, what came to mind immediately was, you know, when I was growing up here in, in Peru, my mother used to actually listen to this priest, Padre Quitapenas. You may have been familiar with this guy, right? <laughs> Padre Quitapenas, father, take away the pain or, you know, right? And he, he had this show that actually ended up every day saying, don't worry, right? You don't have to worry. If your problem has a solution, why do you worry? And if your problem does not have a solution, why do you worry? <laughs> right? So I thought, well, the problem with this secular stagnation thing is that we don't know if there is a solution or there is no solution at this point. So we keep worrying about it. And um, since Larry Summers, in, uh, a couple of years ago, actually put, forward the, the, put forth the hypothesis, then we could keep talking about it, and uh, we keep worrying about it, and I'm not sure whether we should be or we should not be uh, thinking too much about it. But um, in my remarks, I wanted to actually convey some of the sense of why um, I'm still unsure about whether the resources that we're spending on this topic are warranted or not. So, let me just, let me just remark. What are the, uh, well, I think there are some obvious key questions that um, we want to actually um, try to identify in order to try to think about this problem clearly. One is, what exactly do we understand by secular stagnation? I'm not saying that the world economy is not in trouble. It is. But secular stagnation is probably not going to be uh, one of the main issues unless uh, uh, when, when it is defining in a certain way that I'm going to actually uh, try to, try to um, um, argue that, uh, that is, is, is a good way to think about the subject. Um, we want to think about, once we actually agree on this definition, what exactly is the evidence that we are talking about? And um, I'm going to argue that uh, given our current econometric pools in particular, it's very hard that we're going to actually come up with conclusive, edi conclusive evidence that actually we are or not going to enter a secular stagnation issue and uh, um, a secular stagnation era. And this actually turns out to be quite important uh, in differentiating some of the policy responses that we want to think about. Um, now, but I assume that you actually um, accept the idea of, of secular stagnation. You may want to ask, well, what do we know about the causes of secular stagnation, which is uh, obviously very important th to think about the policy implications, right? Um, okay. Am I doing something here? Okay. All right. So as for definition, um, I'm not an expert in the literature, and the literature, the literature obviously is, is very young, but uh, there is actually a very good reference, um, which is a book by, uh, was put together by Vox.org, uh, and the editors are uh, Richard Baldwin and, and Tulin. In 2014, actually, that book uh, uh, um, gathered contributions by Larry Summers, Olivier Blanchard, uh, Gauthier, uh, 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 Egerston, and others. And, and uh, in the introduction to the book, actually, um, Tulin and Baldwin actually said, well, you know, there is a variety of views on, on the subject, but I think that there is a fairly strong consensus about three important points. And one of them is exactly what we want to identify as secular stagnation. And they actually wrote, a workable definition of secular stagnation is that negative real interest rates are needed to equate saving and investment with full employment. Okay? Now I'm going to add something to this, that actually um, uh, these negative real interest rates are supposed to be permanent, not just transitory. I mean, in terms of the history of especially uh, central banking, negative interest rates 
are not that uncommon. I mean, uh, if you look at, for example, a graph of the federal funds rate in real terms, actually the periods in which um, uh, uh, the federal funds rate in real terms that is subtracting expected inflation uh, has, been, has been negative, uh, th th these periods are quite substantial. Right? They are not new. Um, but the, the, the issue is, well, we want to actually th ask the question, well, is it really true that uh, we are going to um, experience a permanent secular uh, period of negative real interest rates? And there, obviously, the evidence says, well, you know, there is actually a strong presumption that we are maybe entering that period. Okay, so um, this is a graph, the blue line. You can forget about the, the, the dotted line. The blue line is, is a graph of um, the 10-year uh, Treasury bond rate uh, corrected by expected inflation. This is actually taken from a paper that I wrote with uh, uh, my colleagues, Anders Fernandez, uh, Fernandez and um, Gulang. And, 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 and the, um, the time period starts in 1990 and actually um, it continues to essentially 2016. So it's actually a very long series. And you can see that the world uh, interest rate, real interest rate, um, when you um, look at it in this way, then was hovering about uh, four, three and four percent before the millennium. But, but then after 2000, there is a clear decline. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard to actually pinpoint exactly when the decline um, started. But, but certainly, it started much before the global financial crisis, which is um, identified by the red bar, which is the Lehman bankruptcy uh, time of September 2008. Right? Um, thinking about this, this, this graph actually is, is uh, informative for a number of reasons. Right? One is that if there is actually uh, a trend that is going to lead, uh, uh, is, is, is actually going to materialize in a period of secular stagnation, then that problem started much before. 2000. Right? I mean, this is a very long, uh, 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 a very long, uh, long development. Certainly, you know, the real interest rate collapsed during the global financial crisis, and as you can see in the graph, after 2011, in particular, it has actually become even more negative. But you know, the longer, t uh, longer horizon trends are, uh, are, if anything, clear to see very early on. Okay. So the next question is, well, you know, suppose that you actually are thinking about um, uh, this, this, this problem, and why is it that we want to worry about, uh, about, about, about this? Well, uh, again, from the trillions and Baldwin consensus, the main worry seems to be that um, it becomes much harder to actually, for monetary policy in particular, to, to do its job, right? I mean, that's what, 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 what the quote in the slide actually says, that the main worry is that it might, might become much harder to achieve full employment with low inflation, and uh, uh, given that there's a zero lower bound on policy interest rates, right? And um, they actually claim, well, it is too early to know uh, whether secular stagnation is more than just old-fashioned slow growth. The old macroeconomic toolkit is inadequate. So I want to actually reflect a little bit about um, this issue of, of whether we will be actually, uh, we are going to be able to decide whether we're going to be entering a period of, of, of secular extermination or not. And the answer is, well, I don't think that that's actually going to be the case uh, within the time frame that, um, um, within a reasonable time frame. I mean, uh, why? Because, you know, this, this is actually, as I mentioned, it's, it's not a business cycle phenomenon. It's, it's more, mostly, a, if, if secular extension is, is here with us, it's, it's actually a trend phenomenon. And we actually should know or know that uh, uh, detecting changes in trends, for example, turns out to be a very tricky business. Right? The, the good analogy here is, for example, the measurement of uh, productivity growth. I mean, you may or may not know that in, in the United States, for example, there is a period around 1973 where people actually say, well, there was something that we call the productivity slowdown. Around 1991, productivity actually jumped up. They say, well, there, there was a technological uh, revolution that actually brought up productivity back up. And then maybe, but we don't know yet, right, after the global financial crisis, productivity has come down again permanently, right? But it actually takes several years, and we're talking about decades, perhaps, to actually be able to decide whether there has been actually a change in the trend or not, right? Um, now, um, 
That um, being said, I mean, suppose that you actually accept the idea that um, secular stagnation is, is, is here um, with us. Well, um, there, then, uh, the, the, um, the consequences for monetary policy are pretty much well known, right? As, as is um, uh, explicit in the slide, uh, one of the main issues is not the negative real interest rates by, by themselves, but the, it's mostly the ability of central banks to actually stimulate the economy in case of need. Right? And this actually comes uh, not only, as the slide actually um, um, uh, states, by the fact that central bankers actually have to um, respect or, or, or are, are constrained by some lower bound on, on, on nominal interest rates, but also the fact that low interest rates actually might be connected to the emergence of bubbles, such as real estate bubbles, um, and uh, say what is called now uh, uh, reaching uh, rich for yield. Uh, especially that's what, for example, BIS view in the um, uh, in, in the classification of, of the previous speaker actually is, is about, right? Just to illustrate, actually, you can actually, this has been argued that very low interest rates were crucial in the generation of the real estate bubble in the United States, and therefore the global financial crisis. I mean, I might not have to actually uh, remark this, but you know, here, here are some graphs for, uh, just, just, just for, 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 for the record. I mean, here the red line is the federal funds rate, um, from 2000 on and until, I mean, for the, for the decade of, of 2000 to 2010. And you can see that actually the, the, uh, the, the millennium started with a fair funds rate of about 6.5%, which was uh, quickly brought uh, down to 1% by um, 2003. And this was in re response to uh, a recession in the United States, obviously. Um, now, Alan Greenspan, obviously, was, was criticized because uh, this period of, of, of interest rates actually may have generated a real estate bubble in the United States. Right? I mean, here, just to, 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 to illustrate, I mean, here is the um, case Schiller um, uh, real estate price index for the 20 major cities in the United States. And you can see that between 2000 and 2006, essentially, prices, uh, housing prices in the United States doubled. Right? Now, many people actually um, uh, accuse the Federal Reserve from having, quote, unquote, generated the bubble in this way because of the low interest rate uh, uh, policy. Now, uh, there are two problems with this view. One is that it's very hard to actually test that proposition. Two is that it, uh, it, it's actually uh, the generation of bubbles is, is an aspect of our theories our, and our models that we don't really know much about. Okay? And um, so if, if this view the view that low interest rates actually are, are conducive to bubbles, even if it, that you were, were, were actually true, then we don't know what the consequences might be for, for example, monetary management uh, in particular. Okay, um, I already see this on, on the evidence. Um, Let me just um, uh, uh, um, stress now the question about causes. I mean, when you think, think about real interest rates, as I have mentioned at the beginning, the graph actually and, and the facts uh, uh, are, are, are strongly suggestive of the fact that if there is a secular stagnation problem, then it started much before the global financial crisis, right? So if you accept that view, then you have to accept also the, the interpretation that the culprits are, are, are probably uh, longer run drivers of economic performance, such as productivity determinants and growth, right? I mean, it's true, for example, that I mean, you, you have to actually start thinking, well, you know, what are going to be the innovations or, or the products that are going to drive, say, the growth, the growth of, 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 of the economy uh, in the next um, couple of decades, for example, right? In contrast, some other suspects, some usual suspects, like financial excesses and, uh, you know, over um, um, ambitious bankers or whatnot, they, they appear less likely, right? I mean, I'm not saying that this is not a problem, again, but I'm saying that from the viewpoint of the secular stagnation issue, these uh, financial um, Financial excesses, for example, turn to be much less, uh, uh, mu mu much less uh, important or, or, or relevant. Now, 
all of this being said, the next question is, well, even if there's the problem of, of secular stagnation, what, what, what are the implications for monetary policy? Is it so important that actually we delve too much about whether we are in an era of secular stagnation or not? And then my reaction after thinking about it some is, is, is very ambivalent. In some sense, the implications for monetary policy are not that surprising. They are not uh, hard to see, right? I mean, we know, even from the definition, that the main problem is, well, central bankers actually are going to exhaust their, um, um, their, their conventional instrument, interest rate uh, management, right? So now there are a lot of us working on the appropriate um, changes that may be important in order to deal with that aspect of the problem. For example, there's a lot of work about um, unconventional monetary policy, for example. Um, in particular, if you're interested in, 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 in a great discussion, uh, Ben Bernanke's blog has, um, has an excellent discussion of what tools the Federal Reserve might have left um, that actually he published uh, a month ago. Going from negative interest rates, um, uh, in, they including quantitative easing and whatnot, and then um, helicopter money. Um, one alternative that I think that deserves more discussion is, question, is, is uh, the possibility of changing our framework completely. Like, for example, moving away completely from interest rate control or, or, or increasing inflation targets in, in, in uh, countries uh, that actually have adopt, uh, adopted IT as their monetary framework. But, you know, these are all um, aspects of monetary policy making that um, actually there's much discussion and research going on. And in some sense, whether or not you actually are entering a secular estimation era or not has very little bearing on this discussion. The issues are a little uh, harder and different when you talk about fiscal policy. I mean, when thinking about secular estimation, a lot of people have said, well, you know, this actually calls for, uh, as Tulin and Bowen say, uh, a set of pro-growth policies that economists have urged for years, right? So, for example, there is now some um, fashion uh, in between macroeconomists to actually argue that there should be more uh, expenditures and, say, expanding infrastructure, say, fiscal expenditures that actually are, are um, uh, directed at repairing uh, roads or building bridges and whatnot. Now, when I think about the secular stagnation issue, actually, um, the effectiveness of those policies actually become, becomes much, much harder to, 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 to defend. I mean, in fact, economists' advice has been hardly effective in uh, achieving permanently faster growth. Okay. I mean, it's easy to say that actually countries grow faster, but, uh, you know, we had to tell them how exactly we're going to achieve that, right? And, and telling them, well, you know, we are going to actually enact some pro-growth policies is just telling the uh, Peruvian national team that they had to score more goals to win more games, right? Um, I mean, that doesn't actually uh, help us that much. Actually, uh, almost as important is that a lot of these prescriptions have been pretty much devoid of uh, the proper uh, welfare analysis and, and economic analysis that might tell us, for example, how exactly they are going to work in order to actually um, address the possible market failures that are behind um, uh, secular stagnation. Okay. I mean, growth by itself is not necessarily, uh, as we do economists agree, um, uh, welfare enhancing. Right. We might want to actually, uh, we, we want to identify policies that actually address some kind of market failure, some kind of shortcoming of, um, uh, of say, the equilibrium in, of, of free markets, presumably, right? And actually, our, our analysis of secular explanation has been uh, uh, curiously uh, devoid of, of, of that kind of uh, welfare um, analysis. In any case, so, um, as I, I started um, my talk talking about whether I 
uh, we should worry or not about um, this problem. And um, I'm still not sure exactly what the answer should be. Right? Um, I have tried to argue that uh, if you actually believe that secular stagnation is with us, then you should be alarmed. But it's not so clear what we should do or whether we can do something about it. Right? Um, conclusive evidence will actually prove to be elusive. And um, policy implications, as, I, as um, I'm, I'm writing on, in the slide, are, are either obvious or they are unclear. So um, I guess that um, I will have to give a call to Padre Quintapenas and see if he can help us with that one. Thank you. <laughs>